Hey everyone, JL here, and welcome back to Bridge the Divine, where I examine irrational beliefs, the irrational behaviors that follow, and how we, with education, rationality, and reason, can bridge the societal divides that they create. Many of you are probably aware that I've recently been embroiled in explaining evolution to young earth creationists. A few times, this was meant to go to debate, the first time against Nephilim Free, a prominent young earth creationist, but he decided to run away before we could decide on a proper format. Probably because the structure that he wanted was the same structure that got him banned from modern day debate for rage quitting after James tried to moderate him. Based on the code, coding of the information in the bacteria, now, if I gotta turns say, on a gene, excuse me, excuse me, you can go in for a hot minute. Turn, excuse me, nephilim, turns, nephilim turns nephilim on the nephilim gene, nephilim which is me. So oh. is, if you can both give me a second, just, to, just there are a number of points that you made, Neff. So we do want to wrap it up right here might be a good upper. All right, Nephilim Free is left. Me? So I've got to tell you, Neff, if you left on purpose, I, I'm not going to hear you now give a mouthful to why I'm unfair or whatever else. Did you leave on purpose, Neff? I'm asking you to unmute. I'm giving you a fair shot. Oh, okay. Well, there he goes. Next up was Otangelo, who in a recent Discord conversation with me that I lament not recording, finally copped to his bad faith position debating creationism against atheists, not because he believes in creationism or even because he thinks it's an important topic, but just because they're atheists. When I held him to this break in his epistemology, he also bowed out and now refuses to debate me on anything. So while MC Tune and I are setting up the next debate, which will be me against Eric Jewell, another creationist, I figured I'd take the time to look at this other creationist video that was recently recommended to me. And when I saw who put it out, I just had to bring him back. So welcome back Kyle Butt from the World Video Bible School, here for the debunk hat trick. Okay, Kyle, third time's the charm. What do you got? In the year 2002, in Cobb County, Georgia, there was a sticker that was placed on the inside cover of the biology textbooks. That sticker simply said that these textbooks contain information on evolution. Evolution is a theory, not a fact, about living organisms, and it should be looked at with an open mind, studied carefully, and critically considered. First and foremost, the ignorance on that sticker floored me as it demonstrates that whoever wrote it out possessed no understanding of what a scientific theory actually is. In the context of the sticker, theory is used in the colloquial sense, meaning a sudden insightful guess. But, in scientific terms, we know that theory means the best evidence-backed mechanistic explanation for any observed phenomena. Examples of such are the theories of disease, plate tectonics, cell organization, general relativity, and quantum electrodynamics, just to name a few. Secondly, considering the decision to use these stickers was made by a school board, I had to look into it further. What I found was an intriguing little tidbit in the history of American education. While the teaching of evolution was legally mandated in the state of Georgia, it was common practice in the Cobb County School District to remove all of the pages discussing evolution from the students' textbooks. That's because since 1976, the CCSD had policies in place to accommodate for religious objections. When local parents learned that the new textbooks would strengthen the teaching of evolution, they petitioned hard against their use. The sticker that was then placed in the textbook was an attempt by the school board to diffuse the situation between them and the parents. And the use of those stickers resulted in numerous organizations around the nation applauding the school district for opening the doors in the classroom to creationism and intelligent design. This ultimately led to parent Jeffrey Selman bringing action against the school district in 2002, arguing that the stickers placed undue restrictions on the teaching of evolution, restrictions that did not apply to any other scientific theory. The case went to trial, and in 2005, federal district judge Clarence Cooper decided against the CCSD, ruling that the stickers violated both the Georgia and U.S. constitutions. The case was appealed, but then ultimately settled out of court in favor of the plaintiffs. Do you know if you were to take the sentiments of that sticker and you were to look at the evidences for evolution with an open mind and you study them carefully and you critically consider them, what you would find is 
that the stickers violated the U.S. and Georgia constitutions and were subsequently removed? Oh, sorry, you weren't finished. Please continue. These evidences don't prove evolution at all. Already we have a big issue. Evolution isn't so much proven as it is demonstrated. This is a major distinction that Kyle seems to be ignoring. I honestly don't know why, but something tells me that that point will be important later on. Here are six supposed evidences for evolution that simply are not good reasons to believe in evolution. We don't just believe evolution because some people say it's true. We accept the conclusion of evolution by means of natural selection because it's been observed, demonstrated, and we understand it to be true. Accepting it is literally accepting reality. This seems to be a recurring theme with this guy. Number one, vestigial organs. In 1865, a German anatomist named Robert Weidersheim said that he discovered 185 different useless or virtually useless organs in the body. Given prior experience, I've learned to take Kyle's quote citations with a grain of salt, so I dug a little deeper. Robert Wiedersheim was a German anatomist who in 1887 published an academic treatise called The Structure of Man, but it became so popular that he expanded on the work and published it as a book in 1893. Contained in that book was his famous list of 86 vestigial organs, not 185 like Kyle asserted. As the general scientific understanding of human anatomy improved over the years, that list was slowly increased to 180 vestiges. It's also worth noting that the term vestiges here is very important because in the field of evolutionary biology, it does not solely mean useless. It actually refers to both structures that have lost all function and structures that have some diminished use. Wiedersheim himself stated that vestigial organs are wholly or in part functionless and have lost their original physiological significance. During the Tennessee Scopes trial in 1925, Wiedersheim's work was cited when zoologist Horatio Newman said in a written statement that was read into evidence, there are, according to Wiedersheim, no less than 180 vestigial structures in the human body, sufficient to make of a man a veritable walking museum of antiquities. And he said this was evidence of evolution. That makes perfect sense, seeing as how evolution is changes in organisms over time as a result of positive selection pressures on gene alleles. If the alleles that result in certain physiological structures are no longer selected for, then those structures will become vestigial, while other structures improve, increase, or even change in function. In fact, the argument goes that if humans evolved, then they would have had at one time organs that an animal would have used in a certain way, but would no longer be used in that way in the human body, and those organs would begin to atrophy and start to be useless. While I disagree with Kyle for showing linear models of evolution, as those have long since been discarded for being incredibly misleading, I do agree with the statement here. He pretty much described evolution. Good on you, Kyle. The problem with this vestigial organ idea is that there are two reasons it cannot prove evolution. Spoke too soon. Number one, if you did have vestigial organs in your body, that wouldn't prove evolution. You see, evolution has to go from a single cell organism to a human, and you don't need organs that are decaying and atrophying. You need evolution to produce new organs. That is precisely what evolution does. Vestigiality is the loss of function or diminished function of a physiological structure. A great example of this is the human appendix. While it no longer serves its original function and can even be removed with no lasting effects, it actually still serves a minute function in your digestive system by replenishing helpful bacteria when those bacteria are lost. Sometimes structures even have their function co-opted for a use other than the one naturally selected for in a process called exaptation. A good example of this would be feathers used as mating displays in birds, structures that originally evolved to keep them warm. And when Kyle uses the terms decay and atrophy, it's actually a misrepresentation of what's actually happening. The process of decay refers to the decomposition of organic matter and is inappropriate to use here. And atrophy actually has two meanings. 
The first, and more commonly used, describes the wasting away of a physiological structure due to cell degradation, similar to a muscle losing function from lack of use. The other version is used in evolutionary biology to describe the exceedingly long process of becoming, you guessed it, vestigial. We should find wings that are almost ready to allow organisms to fly that can't yet fly. We should find new visionary optical connections in living organisms that don't have them. We should see things adding information, not losing genetic information. Firstly, half-functioning organs don't occur in a species population. Such things only occur in an organism due to severe genetic defects. For an organism to pass on its genes, it must survive long enough to reproduce. And yes, severe genetic defects do sometimes occur randomly in reproduction, but if those defects are severe enough, they often preclude the organism's survival and ability to pass on those defective genes. What we do observe are the small structural changes that occur over time that do not result in a loss of functionality. These small changes over time are what evolution is. Kyle is merely misrepresenting the entire field. And the second problem with the vestigial organ argument is that that 185 list of vestigial organs, it began to dwindle very rapidly when? when we started looking more closely into them and it became 180 and then 175 and then... Kyle is once again cherry picking the data or counting the hits and ignoring the misses. And there are a lot of misses he's ignoring. I first have to point out that the list of vestigial structures that Kyle is showing there is nowhere close to being comprehensive. Of all the vestigial structures that are available, he only cites 16 of them, and then he scrolls through them super fast to make the list look more substantial. And by the way, Kyle, the tongue is not vestigial. What he may be referring to are the foliate papillae, which are vestigial structures located on the sides of the tongue near the base. It must also be pointed out that while some of the vestigial structures on that list do retain some function, there are several there that are completely useless such as the palmaris longus, a vestigial muscle that presents as a small tendon in the forearm, which has no use for us anymore. In fact, if you're one of the 86% of the human population that still has yours, its uselessness in the forearm makes it perfect for tendon repair in other areas of the body. So no, Kyle, not everything on your cherry-picked list is still functional. Do you know as we look more into the body, we realize that those vestigial organs were very useful. Many of them extremely useful. Just not all of them. Number two, the idea of homology. We're told that similarity proves ancient ancestry. And what I simply mean by that is we're told that because humans have similar physical characteristics to certain animals, that proves that they evolved from animals. Well, similarity doesn't prove evolution at all. In fact, you could see things that are similar and you would realize that those similarities are often caused by a common designer. It literally blows my mind that Kyle is either so ignorant of evolutionary biology that he thinks that this makes sense, or that he thinks his audience is so ignorant that he can commit this logical fallacy and just get away with it. Whichever it may be, what Kyle is doing here is called begging the question. He's presupposing a creator, then interpreting homology as evidence for the creator that he already thinks exists. This isn't how we come to the conclusion of evolution. We don't start with the assumption of evolution and then interpret the evidence to justify the assumption. And this is because when you start with the presumption that your conclusion is true, then that leads to confirmation bias. Suppose there were a supernatural intelligent designer. And now he's asking his audience to make the exact same mistake. And he created a world where many organisms would need to drink the same water, eat the same kinds of food, walk over the same types of terrain. What would happen? Well, obviously he would use similarities, similar structures to accomplish his goals. Similarity doesn't prove common ancestry. What's interesting is that Kyle doesn't explain exactly why homology isn't evidence for evolution. He just claims it isn't. 
He's just using the observation of homology to make even more claims regarding the intentions of this creator that he hasn't even demonstrated yet. So that makes two unjustifiable claims that Kyle has made. In actuality, the observation of homology was one of the first pieces of evidence that led to the conclusion of common ancestry. A prime example of this are tetrapods, four-limbed animals that compose the superclass Tetrapoda. It includes extant and extinct amphibians, reptiles, and synapsids. All tetrapods have homologous limb structures because they descended from an ancestor population that had that exact same structure. We can directly observe these homologous structures in humans, dogs, horses, cats, birds, frogs, seals, and many, many more. But something Kyle dismissed was that these homologous structures also occur outside of tetrapods. Cetaceans also possess the very same structures, as well as vestigial pelvises and hind limbs. So if Kyle's common designer made land-dwelling four-limbed animals homologous because it worked best for them on land, why would that same designer give those same structures to a species that is not land-dwelling or even four-limbed? This is what happens when you interpret evidence to support your pre-held conclusion. The real answer as to why cetaceans possess homologous structures is because all living cetaceans descended from a common ancestor that was a tetrapod. In fact, similarity argues more for a common creator than anything else. No, it doesn't, as I just explained. Supposed evidence for evolution number three, the fossil record. You know what we're told is that you can look into the fossil record and you can find proof that organisms evolved over millions of years? In the simplest terms, the fossil record reveals the extinction, change, and appearance of new species over time. Supposedly we're told that you can find transformational organisms. This is wholly misleading. Transformational organisms is not a thing. Transitional forms, however, is. And transitional forms are species that are intermediate between two species. Transitional fossils show a transitional form between two species. One of the best examples of this is Archaeopteryx, a transitional form between dinosaurs with no feathers and modern-day birds. ...that prove this animal evolved into some other kind of animal? Demonstrate, not prove. But if you were to take that seriously... Which we do, because it's evidence and you were to go to the fossil record, what you would find is that those transformational fossils are missing on a grand scale. In fact, evolutionist Mark Ridley stated that no real evolutionist, whether gradualist or punctuationist, uses the fossil record as evidence in favor of the theory of evolution as opposed to special creation. Once again, prior experience with Kyle's videos demanded I look deeper into this quote. Mark Ridley is a British zoologist, evolutionary biologist, and writer on evolution. He studied at Cambridge and Oxford in the 80s, and his doctoral advisor was none other than Richard Dawkins. And this is why I love the internet. Because what it allowed me to discover was that the quote that Kyle is citing here came from an issue of New Scientist magazine in 1981. Kyle recorded his video in 2019, over 37 years later, and within that nearly four-decade gap, we have made incredible advancements in understanding the fossil record, one of which was the discovery of Tiktaalik, a major transitional fossil in 2004. So, not only is that quote horribly outdated, but if we read further, we see once again Kyle is cherry-picking the information to suit his narrative. What Ridley goes on to say is, this does not mean the theory of evolution is unproven. So just what is the evidence that species have evolved? There have traditionally been three kinds of evidence, and it is these, not the fossil evidence, that the critics should be thinking about. The three arguments are from the observed evolution of species, from biogeography, and from the hierarchical structure of taxonomy. So we can see that Ridley was actually telling critics of evolution to stop attacking the fossil record and start looking at these other suggestions. Because they, like Kyle today, don't really understand what the fossil record does. So Kyle is actually attempting to convince his audience that a Cambridge PhD in biology who works and teaches in the field 
doesn't actually accept the field that he works in. And he does this by misleading the audience with cherry-picked quotes from outdated sources. Don't you just love it when they do the work for you? No, why would he say that? Well, he would say that because when you look at the fossil record, you see organisms coming into the fossil record fully formed. You see a stage of stasis where they do not change, and then they go out of the fossil record without evolving into anything else. This has got to be the weirdest attempt at presenting punctuated equilibrium that I've ever heard. The theory of punctuated equilibrium was developed by paleontologists Niles Eldredge and Stephen Jay Gould in 1972. In a nutshell, Punctuated equilibrium is a theory that proposes that once a species appears in the fossil record, its population will become stable, showing little to no evolutionary change over its geological history. This lack of morphological change is called stasis. Eldridge and Gould propose that evolution occurs in rare and geologically rapid events of branching speciation called cladogenesis. Punctuated equilibrium is often contrasted against phyletic gradualism, the idea that evolution occurs uniformly and by the slow and gradual transformation of entire lineages, a process called anagenesis. Creationists have been glomming onto Gould's work, claiming that punctuated equilibrium is evidence for the creation model since the 80s. Here is what Gould had to say about that in his article, Evolution as Fact and Theory, in 1983. Faced with these facts of evolution and the philosophical bankruptcy of their own position, creationists rely upon distortion and innuendo to buttress their rhetorical claim. If I sound sharp or bitter, indeed I am, for I have become a major target of these practices. I count myself among the evolutionists who argue for a jerky or episodic rather than a smoothly gradual pace of change. In 1972, my colleague Niles Eldridge and I developed the theory of punctuated equilibrium. We argued that two outstanding facts of the fossil record, geologically sudden origin of new species and failure to change thereafter, stasis, reflect the predictions of evolutionary theory, not the imperfections of the fossil record. In most theories, small isolated populations are the source of new species, and the process of speciation takes thousands or tens of thousands of years. This amount of time, so long when measured against our lives, is a geological microsecond. Since we proposed punctuated equilibria to explain trends, it is infuriating to be quoted again and again by creationists, whether through design or stupidity I do not know, as admitting that the fossil record includes no transitional forms. Transitional forms are generally lacking at the species level, but they are abundant between larger groups. Exactly as the creation model would predict. And once again, Kyle is begging the question, presupposing a creationist model and then interpreting the evidence with the bias of that presupposed conclusion. Unfortunately for him, by calling out the fossil record in this manner, he has only demonstrated his lack of understanding of what the fossil record is actually used for. And he doesn't even address evolutionary bottlenecking, adaptive radiation, or even the founder effect, concepts that would further his understanding of the fossil record. The fossil record does not prove evolution. Incorrect. The fossil record is not the best evidence for evolution. This is why Ridley recommended critics stop attacking the fossil record, because the way they're attacking it demonstrates that they don't understand it, and he suggested that they go after the really good evidence for evolution. Like direct observations of evolution, or the theory of island biogeography, or the hierarchical structure of taxonomy. Number four, the idea of mutations. We're told that mutations prove you could get a certain single-celled organism to mutate over multiplied millions of years and bring about new information on a grand scale that given enough time, you could get a human being. Well, if you increase that number by about 60,000%, you'd be spot on. What's the problem with that line of reasoning? There isn't one. It's the conclusion that the evidence leads us to. The problem is that mutations don't give us new information. They most certainly do. Mutations can only take information that is already available and cause it to decay. That's blatantly not true. Mutations are an example of a loss of genetic information. 
I'm beginning to think Kyle doesn't really understand what mutations are. Cowabunga! Mutations are just a change in the genetic code, and they come in many varieties. Those varieties are often broken down into beneficial, neutral, or deleterious mutations. But to directly refute what Kyle said there, mutations do result in new information. In fact, this is precisely what point mutations do. Point mutations are a single change to a nucleotide, resulting in an entirely new allele. That new allele is now new information for the population. Kyle is even ignoring the fact that sometimes the loss of information can be beneficial, while the gain can be deleterious depending upon the positive selection pressures. Honestly, Kyle, have you looked into any of this? Let me give you an example. For the last hundred years or more now, scientists have been studying fruit flies. They are great examples of how you can mutate an organism. We have been zapping these fruit flies with radiation and mutating them in chemical ways for more than a hundred years now. The reason that they are so valuable to study is because you can get a new generation every 14 days. We have in that hundred year period the equivalent of what would be millions of years of evolutionary time. And what do you have after all the radiation and mutation? Do you have a fruit fly that has evolved new genetic information? No, you don't. In fact, all you still have is a fruit fly. It hasn't evolved into anything else. Wow, so that was a complete misrepresentation of the fruit fly experimentation. It's almost like Kyle thinks our expectation of the fruit fly experiment was to irradiate fruit flies and then breed them until we got an entirely new organism. Well, that wasn't the point of the experiment, and that's not how evolution works. The purposes of these experiments, going all the way back to Thomas Morgan in the 1900s, was to observe gene transfer in selected populations as a result of controlled selective pressures. And the information we've gotten from these experiments has been instrumental in improving our understanding of the entire field of genetics. Mutations don't prove evolution. That's simply not the mechanism that could get a single-celled organism to a human. That's a half-truth. Mutations are only one of many factors that play into the process of evolution by natural selection. So sure, Kyle, it wasn't mutation alone, just don't be dishonest and leave out all the other things along the way. Number five, English peppered moths. I actually remember reading about this back in school, and it's kind of neat. We're told that English peppered moths provide an example of evolution in action. They do. It's one of those direct observations that Ridley was talking about. You see, before the Industrial Revolution, there were two varieties of English peppered moths. One dark colored, one light colored, but the light colored was much higher in ratio than the dark colored. So far, so good. But after the Industrial Revolution, the dark colored became the more prominent color and the light, the fewer in the mix. He's got it. The ratio of light colored moths to dark colored moths inverted after the Industrial Revolution. The differences in the moths were even documented in 1848, 10 years before Darwin and Wallace outlined natural selection. And in 2016, researchers at the University of Liverpool finally pinpointed the cause of this to 1819. The ratio flipped because as more and more soot accumulated and coated the habitats of the moths, the darker moths were able to hide more easily while their lighter counterparts were picked off by predators. It is a perfect example of an evolutionary pressure having a demonstrable effect on the allele selection in a species. And we're told that's because birds could see the light colored better, etc. And this was supposedly an example of natural selection. Oh my word, he got it. The problem with this example is, number one, many of the pictures were faked because the English peppered moths don't often land on tree trunks, and the entire idea was flawed in that way. He's actually right there. There were a lot of faked photos making the rounds in the mid-20th century as a result of people trying to make a quick buck in the wake of increased interest in naturalism. But with advancements in technology, the practice tapered off. So what Kyle is actually doing here, arguing that some old photos were faked, is just a straw man. Yes, that's true. It doesn't disprove the conclusion of evolution by natural selection. But the second problem was that before the Industrial Revolution, the genetic information in the English peppered moth genome had 
genetic information for two varieties. Of course it would be. The genes for both would have to be present in the species. Then, an evolutionary pressure selects for one presentation over another, resulting in the ratio of genetic presentation changing. And after the genetic information was the same. English pepper moths simply do not prove evolution. Kyle literally used one of the best examples of evolution, explained why it's one of the best examples of evolution, and then flatly dismissed it with no explanation? And this guy calls himself an educator? And number six, horse evolution. Aw, oh, Kyle, not the livestock. If you were to look in your biology textbooks, you would see that horse evolution is often used as evidence that evolution really occurred. Horse evolution is used as evidence that evolution occurred. Kyle, I ask this in all seriousness. Who the hell does your writing? You would see a, a picture of a very small animal, almost looks like a fox or something like that, evolving into modern horse. Kyle is referring to Eohippus, an ancient ancestor of modern horses from about 60 million years ago. Why he thinks it looks like a fox is beyond me. But this scenario is fabricated. It's not true. It was made up. No, it wasn't. In fact, more than 50 years ago, Dr. George Gaylord Simpson said, the uniform continuous transformation of Hyracotherium into Equus so dear to the hearts of generations of textbook writers never happened in nature. Once again, I needed to dive into a quote that Kyle presents to see if that's what's actually being said. Dr. George Gaylord Simpson was an American paleontologist and is widely considered to be the most influential paleontologist of the 20th century. He was an expert on extinct mammals and their intercontinental migrations. Simpson also dispelled the myth that the evolution of the horse was a linear process that resulted in the modern horse. The quote that Kyle is citing here comes from Simpson's book, Life of the Past, An Introduction to Paleontology. It's a textbook on paleontology. Yeah, Kyle is citing the textbook of a leading paleontologist in an effort to refute paleontology as a science. And, taken in context, we see that Simpson was actually writing that horse evolution was not linear, as the image would suggest. He understood back in the 50s that linear evolution models, such as this one, are deeply misleading and should not be referenced. Simpson then goes on to explain how horse evolution was actually deeply complex as depicted by this accurate model based on the evidence. And once again, Kyle is trying to convince his audience that a professional expert doesn't actually believe the things that they are a professional expert in. You see this? information that's presented to us as proof that evolution actually occurred is not proof at all. Kyle, you've already demonstrated that you are either deeply ignorant of this field and you're just regurgitating the crap spewed by other creationists, or possibly that you do know that this is inaccurate and you're just banking on the ignorance of your audience in order to further your creationist agenda. And despite how egregious Kyle's presentation has been, I'll leave the final determination up to the audience. If we look at it with an open mind and we study it carefully and we critically consider it, we'll realize that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and all of the organisms, and evolution just simply didn't play any part in God's creation. And Kyle just had to wrap it all up in a false dichotomy. I hate to break it to you, Kyle, but you have provided no evidence whatsoever for the existence of your god or the validity of your creationist model. All you've done is created a false dichotomy between evolution and creationism. Even if you were to, beyond a shadow of a doubt, prove that evolution was false, it still wouldn't prove the existence of your god. Those are two separate claims that are not mutually exclusive. You just saying that the only option other than evolution is God is just logically fallacious. So like the previous two times, we can see that Kyle is either just pulling his argument straight out of his last name, or he's being deliberately deceptive to sell his audience something that he cannot honestly back up. So that's the hat trick of fail for Kyle. And I'm kind of glad I got to this one last, because I think it's the proverbial nail in the coffin for this guy. Regardless if he's ignorant or lying, what's been demonstrated is that Kyle is absolutely not someone to go to for any kind of scientific understanding. 
because seeking out answers and education from the established experts in these fields will go a long way to bridging the societal divides that theistic ignorance and deception create. Thank you for joining me for another Bridge the Divide. I know this one was a little on the long side. If you enjoyed it, please like and subscribe and be sure to hit that bell for notifications. And don't forget, January is Blood Donor Month, hence the semi-red beard. I'll touch this up later. So be sure to help out if you're able to donate at a clinic in your area. Also, if you dig scary movies, be sure to check out me and my filmmaker friends at the Week in Horror podcast, now in our third season. All the links you need to support me on this channel or over to our podcast are in the description below. Thank you again for your continued support. And as always, be safe, be excellent to each other, and together we can bridge the divide.